AI. You mean artificial intelligence. The recurring motif of modern science fiction is somehow the machines become aware and then become our masters. I mean, that's the great anxiety of our time. Some of my colleagues have a notion that we're going to evolve into machines, that gradually we'll take little bits and pieces of machine parts and the machines will become more biological and in the end there's not going to be an us and a them problem, but we will have evolved into being more cyborg. If our information technologies are doubling in their power of a year, which means they will improve by a factor of a million over the next 20 years, it's going to have a very profound impact. And the capability of machines will vastly outstrip that of, of humans. We can make an artificial intelligence smarter than we are right now with the hardware we have, but we don't know how to hook it up. It's got to be possible in principle. We may have the wrong theory today, we may have the wrong theory tomorrow, but some way or other, what the brain is is a great, big, massive computer. Every time computers get more powerful, they basically threaten our established understanding of ourselves, both in terms of who we are or who we could be. If I have my computer doing something for me, is that an extension of myself? Is there really a self there? Is that just a, a bot? So I think the self is, is really going to undergo some transformation or expansion in the coming decade. As we try to build a mechanical intelligence, for me, I see it as an internal quest. It's really an effort to understand ourselves. The human brain is the most elaborate object we know of in the universe. You know, it's far more elaborate than any star or nebula or quasar in terms of its complexity and its levels of emergence. Um, so I think it's kind of natural that we're always going to be striving to more fully understand that system. Well, it's a very old uh, issue. I mean, it goes back to the 18th century, la machine, the idea that we are machines. And of course, if by machine you mean a physical system capable of performing certain functions, then we are machines. If you think of how the brain works as a physical system, well, it seems to me the brain is a type of machinery. And that means if we understood how it worked, we ought to be able to build a duplicate brain. We ought to be able to build something that would do the same thing, that would also cause consciousness. In 1950, Alan Turing claimed that a digital computer suitably programmed could adequately simulate the linguistic output of a typical human being. And Turing famously claimed that in the event of adequate simulation of a human being's linguistic output by a digital computer suitably programmed, the only reasonable thing to say is that that computer is intelligent. Turing provided the uh, logical foundations for computer science, established what is a computation and what computations could and could not do. The potential of this as a parallel world, as a way to, one, reflect life, but two, maybe even to make another kind of life, was obvious from the very beginning. And that researchers' heads began to fill with all kinds of imaginings about what would happen if these things became more powerful. People had always wanted some tangible way to talk about and to investigate, to explore the mind and the brain. And since the year dot, it just had not been possible. You know, the best you could do was sit around and, and chin wag. Some of the early advances in AI, like uh, Simon and Newell's general problem solver and some of the early chess programs. They were able to make much more progress on some human cognitive problems, things that people said, well, geez, if you could beat a chess master with a computer, you've got intelligence, right? I mean, because it takes an intelligent person to play chess. So some of the early problems that AI tackled, they had quite surprising success with until it was sort of discovered that, you know, that these were the easy problems. And so, yes, a computer can play chess, but no, a computer can't tell the pawn from the king. You know, that's the hard problem. That's what they didn't realize. If you learn to recognize one chess set, you give him like some Marcel Duchamp chess set, where everybody else can tell what the pieces are, he can't tell, you know? So the, the hard things are the things that we take for granted. That's actually the key to human intelligence. We're not very good, actually, at logical, analytical thinking. Computers are already much better than us at considering the logical implications of many different factors. We are very good at recognizing certain types of patterns, a face, speech sounds. The machines have not matched that yet. Machines are getting better and better. Ultimately, when machines do match human pattern recognition, they can combine it with other ways in which machines are greatly superior to people. Machines can remember billions of things accurately, 
They can do logical analyses at extremely high speed. They can share their knowledge instantly, whereas we can only share our knowledge at the slow speed of language. So the combination of the inherent advantages of machines with the deep powers of pattern recognition that human intelligence represents will be a very formidable combination. Artificial intelligence had a phase where at MIT people talked about symbolic AI, about AI that was built out of rules. And then there was a tremendous movement within the artificial intelligence community to talk about a more neural and biological notions of how AI would be built really from the bottom up, that the rules would emerge and artificial intelligence would emerge, and perhaps even consciousness would emerge from the interaction of agents, from the interaction of, of, a, of, a, of a distributed system where there was no kind of leader, no ego uh, intelligence. It's generally acknowledged that computers are speeding up by a factor of two about 18 months, every 18 months, and that's called Moore's Law. Moore's Law is based on flat chips, two-dimensional chips. Now, our brain is organized in three dimensions. We live in a three-dimensional world. We might as well use the third dimension. One thing we've discovered is that, whereas on the one hand, biology is amazing and remarkable in its diversity and cleverness, but it's also very limited because biological evolution got stuck using certain approaches and then can't really get away from that. For example, building everything out of proteins, which is a very limited class of materials, and all of our thinking is based on electrochemical signaling that is a million times slower than electronic signaling. If we build our circuits at the molecular level in three dimensions, they'll be vastly more powerful than the brain. It looks like the first thing that people will be interested in in building with molecular manufacturing will, of course, be computers because we've been seeing this very steady trend in computer technology. Computers are more powerful. The switches, the smallest parts of the computer have been getting smaller and more precise. As you continue this trend into the future, in not too many years, we're going to reach the point where the switches are going to have to be molecular in size. They're going to have to be connected in complex patterns in three dimensions. And I think that's the obvious first application of nanotechnology. And I think that's the application where there's the most interest, the most excitement, the most funding. Going beyond that, there's a lot of interest in the material sciences and building more precise materials. In other words, if you can control structure at the molecular level, then you can build very light, very strong materials materials that are much lighter and much stronger than anything we have today. In 1978, computer chips were designed by humans flowcharted on a wall. That was the last time that was done. In the 80s, we moved to software that designed our computer circuits. By the mid-1990s, we had what are called reverse compilers, where you can take a, a program like Doom or Halo, you can put that into a compiler and spit out a chip that's optimized to play that program or to run another program, like a signal processing program. And in the late 1990s, we had even a few um, cell phone chips that were designed by the machines using something called evolutionary computation, where the humans just set up the design space and the system discovered the most efficient solution.